Good evening. My name is Johanna Koljonen and you are watching Crosstalks, a collaboration between two of Sweden's leading universities, Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. We are broadcasting today from Stockholm University's Department of Computer and System Science at the Nord Building in Chista Science City, just outside of Stockholm. And you can join us in discussing today's topics on Twitter, where our handle is Crosstalk TV and our hashtag is Crosstalks. The world has changed drastically in just the last 20 years, but the institutions and structures we use to educate people are often hundreds of years old. Are traditional ways of learning still relevant? Is the traditional university with its large buildings and established structures for learning becoming obsolete? How is the role of the teacher changing? And are there universal, timeless principles of learning that remain? How should we utilize new technological advances to enhance learning? Joining us in the studio to discuss these topics are Uno Fors, Professor in IT and Learning, Department of Computer and System Sciences at Stockholm University, with uh, a research focus on simulation and visualization for learning and assessment. Teresa Cerato Pargman, Associate Professor of Human Computer Interaction, Department of Computer and System Sci Sciences, Stockholm University. And Johan Torbjörnsson, uh, Director of the Center for Net Based Learning, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Welcome to Crosstalks. Give them a big hand. So, Teresa, you, you've studied how technology affects learning and education. Um, what are some of the ways uh, in, in which these, the ways we are learning have been changed by te technological advances? Well, thank you for the question. Um, information and communication technologies have multiple effects on uh, our ways to teach and learn. Um, taking the example uh, of the internet, uh, so I can point to it, three main changes that have to do with the, how we access information today, how we interact with information, and also how the information that we produce is uh, stored. So, um, so I can develop a little bit of, I don't know if... Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, with the emergence of the internet, uh, the uh, relationship that we have, the information uh, becomes, uh, the information is free, the information is everywhere. So that has a great impact on educational institutions and on teachers because they are not owning the information any longer. They don't have no longer control over this information or the uh, sources of information that the students are uh, interacting with. So uh, that uh, changes um, the way in which we teach and learn because uh, teaching is not transmitting or communicating information any longer and learning is not reproducing or replicating that information. It's rather to uh, transform information into something new. So this is one of the changes yeah, that are related to the access to the, the, the information. Mm. That, I think, probably is interesting to say that the, uh, this information that's out, uh, that is out there, that is free, is not only the amount of information, but it's also that this information is not organized in an, any specific way. Yeah. So uh, the challenge is, is uh, to uh, help the students to um, to provide them with tools to make sense of of this information. So I would say that that's yeah, a second change. And uh, yeah, Johan, you've been working and trying out perhaps such a tool. Uh, you've been working with online education and online courses for twenty years, which yeah. is historically astonishing. So if we go back twenty years, what was it that made you want to start this in the first place? That's a very interesting question. I think that question is very good to put today on, on the table and um, um, at that time people didn't talk about the internet actually um, it was very popular to talk about CD-ROM <laughs> and, and the interactive education through computers and um, but uh, we got some uh, money from uh, EU to try out new ways to reach out to people living in the forests in Sweden uh, who still 
uh, lived there and uh, didn't yet took the step to move to university. I should say for our international audiences that yes. these are rural communities. They're not living wild in the forest. Exactly. Yeah. We have a big uh, country. And uh, mm. uh, so it was kind of a prototype uh, for what we see also today. We can... There are big needs to reach out to people who uh, don't have equal opportunities to to live in a uh, in a city where you have a uh, university. So at that time we build a bridge um, for people to try out uh, and to, to attend some courses online, and then after that they took their final decision to take their family, qu quit their job or whatever, and and move to university city. And uh, we started with just uh, 25 students, but, but it was very successful. So after a few years, we have uh, a couple of hundreds and uh, then it's just been growing um, um, this trend. But, but this program then was about um, was about giving access to a sort of trial period for the university, but it, it still ultimately culminates in, in joining the real university, so to speak. Yeah. Well, th that's an important question. Uh, it was uh, uh, real university courses, but uh, w we p uh, picked some courses which they anyhow was forced to attend when they come to university. So uh, it was for for real in s some way that they got university credits. But uh, st still at that time, people didn't think that th this was the real university. Today, the picture has changed, I think. So today, uh, many students actually ask for online courses, and these are high. Th this can be high quality, and, and uh, I mean real university, uh, as attending a real university. But at that time, people still thought it was you were forced to move to university city to uh, have so your. So the full idea education. of the university education was very tied to a physical location and mm. and a social context, and and this seems mm. to be slipping. We'll we'll have reason to return to this, I think, during the conversation. <coughs> Pardon. Uno, you work with simulating virtual scenarios for education and training purposes. Um, can you describe just some of the of the situations or some of the kinds of, of, of areas where you're applying uh, the, this? The general idea is to, to prepare students or other kind of learners for, for complex situations in real life, like preparing doctors to meet patients with complex problems, uh, social workers to, to meet, meet people with, with, with drug habits and so on, or actually uh, train people for this. So you could be a virtual interviewer instead, and, and I, can, I can train and prepare myself for, for this situation, for example. If I should be extremely nervous and have never done this before, then I, I could train with a virtual interview a few times and so on. But very specifically, just so we can visualize it, these are, what are these? Are these computer they, programs? Or? Uh, they, are, they, are, they are computer programs, uh, not three-dimensional beings li like we are, but kind of representation on the, on the computer screen of an interviewer or a patient or a student or um, a client uh, in, in, in so, so social care. And by which you can uh, ask questions, you can have a dialogue, you, you can um, di discuss with these. And these virtual humans or virtual characters, they, they react uh, emotionally and, and, and uh, not only on what I am asking, but how I am asking. So they can be upset, angry, happy, or even walk out of the room and say, oh, that was a rude question. I, I, I don't want to answer that. How, so how, does the, how does the program or the, I guess it's a computer game essentially, how does this software know how I asked? Uh, the majority of these systems are like you type in questions mm -hmm. from keyboard. But with the technology nowadays, you can uh, actually have, have automated inter interpretation of human speak. But that is mm -hmm. still a little bit complex. So the majority actually are, are working with the typing questions. Okay. So between you, I think we've covered... Uh, Teresa is speaking about, about information. And you're speaking about the idea of, of, the, of the school and the teaching environment a lot and about access as well. And you're talking about a, a kind of training that is in, indeed impossible to do in a traditional classroom, I would assume. That yeah. That's the benefit. Yeah. Um, because textbook cases are, don't interact with you, uh, essentially. There is something here that is worrying me a little bit, which is I, I seem to remember 
you know, many of us in our audience are grad students. They don't remember the 1980s. But I, I remember in the 1980s, I don't think we so talked so much about information, but we talked more about knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and there is a distinction here. I thought it was interesting that you didn't say say knowledge. So, mm. isn't isn't the education system in fact? And sorry <laughs> if I sound like a complete luddite now, but isn't <laughs> the education system a very good answer to to your question about how do we make new meaning out of this mass of of, of information? Isn't that what schools are for? I I be, become a little worried about the idea that maybe we should change schools, even though I ask a question. I'm I'm retracting my question. <laughs> it, it, why is not the answer a traditional school to to this question of of, of how to sort out the information? Oh no, you looked like you had. I I I, I think uh, traditional uh, schools are, or, or or universities are are good. However, what, what what we can do here is to prepare people for very complex things, mm. like preparing if the, your the client starts to fight with you. Or if, if, if the drug abuser starts to, to, to scream at you, or if the children in schools are, are harassing each other. And those situations are really complex to, to, to train in the real normal school, in a lecture and so on. So that's what I think is, is the new thing with this. You can prepare people to meet unexpected things in a much better way, way than before. Yeah. You <coughs> I think everything is uh, very much about putting things in a context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, information in itself can be worthless, but w when you put it in the context or relate it to something else, then suddenly you have something you can, uh, um, something tangible you can talk about and, and uh, uh, look as knowledge. Uh, but um, uh, and I think also good education, whether it's in, in, in a school or internet, is very much about putting things in a context and, and give the students uh, tools for handling their situation and uh, also um, some transparency about what's going on and preparing for next step. But what you're talking about, I think, is both to put things in a context, I mean, in a real situation, virtualized, and also prepare for next steps, so to say. And, uh, um, uh, but the information in itself can be very hard to, to, to use if you don't have these uh, uh, different uh, criteria for, for fulfilled. Yeah, I think that um, well, first I'm, I was thinking about uh, what do you mean by traditional, you know, educational yeah, institutions and uh, are, you know, the uh, what are the new institutions, the ones that have technology or recognize technology. So, but but uh, uh, but what I think is that uh, yeah, the, the the big challenge that we have today has to do with this um, providing the students tools. Uh, for, as I said before, making sense of the information and uh, and uh, producing insights that uh, have consequences on our actions. So, uh, I mean, learning is, is is not replicating things because the information is out there. As if we are producing the information that is out there, so we are in a way uh, organizing and building app yeah, is, is social memory. So what is important today is to make an insightful and, uh, and, and productive use of these collective resources in, in, in a relevant way in a, in a, in a specific uh, situation. So, it is, so I think that that's the challenge of this, probably the, well, the universities today, to, mm -hmm. to, prepare, to prepare the students to uh, Oh, to make insights that lead to, to actions. So it's not to uh, repeat things, it's not to, uh, to know uh, or summarize uh, what is already known. This is not enough. Because how is, how is this connected to the role of the teacher? Because in a way, you know, the traditional idea of a teacher, certainly on the sort of entry-level courses, would be, well, this is the person, in fact, whose job it is to summarize what is already known. And then some people will say, well, I don't need to do that because I, I shall Google it. Do we need, do we need teachers? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm not the one that's saying you can get, get rid of teachers, but the role of the teachers will, will be different. As, as uh, Teresa said here, that the teachers are now not reading loud out of the textbooks. They are more, more supervising the students how they could learn better and discussing issues and problems and challenges. So I think, yes, teachers will be there for hopefully ever, uh, but in a new role. 
We see that um, very clearly in, in my courses, for example, <clears throat> these are still a sort of prototype for me when I'm doing other things. We have about 10,000 simultaneous students in my math courses. And uh, of course, support and all kinds of services, support is very important. You cannot have an automated system only. You, you need to have a strategy for supporting the students in a good way. And we, we have a level-based support, so some easy questions can be taken by older students. They know very well how thing works and um, so on. And uh, we, more advanced questions we can have uh, higher level support for. And the examination and assessments, of course, should be guaranteed by some academic um, senior staff. And uh, the producers of the material, they are also teaching in some way. We need an editor and a group of teachers who, who make new materials and iterate the, the material uh, together with the students. So here we, we see that we don't have a single teacher. We have a team of uh, teachers who support them in different ways. But Part of this becomes about changing authority mm, in yeah. the context of of teaching. Is this a secretly ideological agenda where you're just trying to bring down the hierarchies? Some people think that and some people get very afraid that being replaced by a computer or yeah. somebody else. And, uh, but uh, um, I think you shouldn't be afraid and th there's no hidden agenda. We, we are all living on this planet and, and uh, we need each other to I mean, we learn from each other. It's very basic, as animals or whatever. We, we need other people to, 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 um, uh, to, to understand and, and uh, some sort of dialogue. And um, uh, all of us have been learning from other people. I Actually, of course, that's also why Uno's uh, training scenarios work, mm -hmm. because learning from the other human in the situation, even if it's a virtualized situation, uh, I'm, I'm realizing that what you guys are doing is in some ways super similar. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, joining us now via Skype uh, is Claire Belisle, a consultant and researcher working, among other things, with the European Commission project Open Education Europe and calling us, I believe, from Ottawa, Canada. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. I'm very happy to join you. Claire, what are the main ways in which digital technology is, is changing the most basic components of education, like reading and writing? Well, if, um, if you ask me that question, I could give you answers concerning a lot of new activities that are going on in schools. But I think that to understand what is changing, I think we have to go back a bit and um, have a broad view of what is actually happening. Because I think that um, digital technology is only the, the uh, emerging part of the iceberg, I think we're undergoing a very important cultural change and that digital technology is helping us bring about this cultural change. But it's probably not the only cause of this change. And to understand the change we're living, I think we have to think about what happened at the Renaissance at the 16th century. They had organized institu educational institutions like we have today. Um, they had a lot of knowledge that needed to be transmitted. Um, I'm thinking about this book of Anne Blair, Too Much to Know. People felt that they, with the printing, they had much too much information. And so I was um, thinking that uh, if we look at what was happening today, the problem we have to face is very similar to the problem that they have faced. This problem is that um, we are still very much thinking of knowledge to be transmitted to the new generations. Whereas the generation, the, the people that are living this revolution, cultural revolution, think about creativity and how to become themselves, how to develop themselves. And we all know that um, schooling as it is now from kindergarten to university is less and less attractive to kids. And that's part of the problem. I think as long as we don't change the basic aim of education, and most teachers are trained for transmission and not for developing human beings and making creative people. So we have to rethink how does knowledge fit into developing creative minds. So mm -hmm. that's what the big change I would say. That's very interesting. Teresa, do you agree? Absolutely. I think that, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with Claire. She's pointing out this, this 
change we are we are viewing learning in in a transformative way in a, a performative way and uh, so uh, and i think that, I, i think that the teachers have a, a have a great task to do so it's a it's a great challenge and i i don't see that the teachers are going are going to disappear in the future i think that it's very important that they are um, leading providing uh, stu uh, providing students with uh, Uh, with conceptual tools, with intellectual tools, to really make sense of the information, to transform this information, to know where uh, uh, they can find information, uh, to 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 criticize this information, uh, uh, to ask about the sources of the information, to understand that the information that they get probably it has been pre-processed by computational processes. So all these. Uh, um, All this, this knowledge, I think it's 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 important for for the students to uh, to know, so as they can um, they can um, make uh, or produce, as I said before, uh, in, insights that mm -hmm. can transform the information and uh, and do s something that has consequences on the action. So it yeah. has very much to do with this creative aspect of learning that Clara was yeah. talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I like this discussion of, about creativity, which Claire uh, talked about, uh, and your uh, discussion about the teacher's role and so on. Uh, but because uh, I think um, um, if you want to create smart groups of students and the smart individuals, so to say, um, it's very important uh, as a leader for the group that you don't destroy uh, the processes which can Uh, create th this phenomenon. Some people talk about the, the wisdom of crowds. The crowd can be very stupid if very everybody stupid. do the same thing as everybody else do. <laughs> For example, buying stocks or, or whatever. Or uh, I mean, there are a lot of funny examples. If you're just standing in a corner at the city and looking up in the sky, people start to look up in the sky and, and ask what they're looking for. And suddenly there are a crowd of people looking up in the sky and more and more people. Th no, But yes, so how do we make sure that the groups that we're creating are not like that? Yeah, I think here the, the new way of learning through, for example, internet and also quite individualized Um, process l like you talk about, uh, you know, also where you can prepare for the next step or prefer, prepare to the discussion, make it possible to have a transparent um, aggregation, so to say, of individual inputs. And as a coach for, for that, it's very important that you you understand how think how things work and and uh, can in some part let it go. Uh, and don't stop anything. Uh, in some parts, be quite strong in, in your position at uh, uh, structuring up the process. But but I I completely agree that we that we should of course teach this sort of transformational processes and this individual knowledge making. But there must still be fundaments that are. Like, I would assume that reading and writing, even in our visual culture, reading and writing would be key. Is reading and writing changing um, f because For instance, children are interacting with with tablets and things like this from from even from when they're very very young. Do we know about this, Claire? Well, uh, when you say that reading and writing are very important, um, I would make uh, the assumption that you are thinking about the written word and the written word on paper. And of course, this is the way that we have dealt with knowledge generally. Uh, predominantly, but it's not the only way of accessing knowledge and of building knowledge, of acquiring knowledge, of developing and of sharing knowledge. But we're s stuck with knowledge and the written word. In the scientific world today, uh, visuals are as important as written words and numbers because the quantity of information cannot be grasped by human minds through words and numbers, but they, it can be grasped. The information can be grasped through visuals, for example. So, uh, If we go along with the new possibilities that we have with the tools we have for visualizing information, for example, then reading and writing has to be rethought in terms of 
these new capacities that we have. Um, just looking at the world, observing today in the scientific world, you, you cannot observe, you don't observe the same thing if you observe just with the human senses and you observe with digital tools. Like even a digital camera will bring mm -hmm. out a lot of things that you couldn't capture before, for example. So you see the, the question of what is changing, it's, it's not only that if people uh, are people reading uh, faster or slower on the screen or on paper, of course, it's important for a teacher that has to bring a student from not be able to read to being able to read at the end of the year. That For them, that's important. But I don't think that we need to solve that problem immediately. What we need to find out is how do we bring together um, the need to invent, discover and create that the digital culture brings about and the conviction that we have that all the knowledge that humanity has accumulated is worth looking into. So it's combining the two that has to be rethought. Mm. Uh, Teresa, what are you thinking? Yeah, I pretty much agree with Claire. I have been uh, studying writing and uh, yeah, what can, one can ask uh, how, uh, I mean, what I have learned about writing and uh, and uh, um, I mean, taking in, in slightly another perspective, I can say that uh, writing activities as learning activities present a specific organization and uh, that organize the multiple relationships that, for example, a writer has with the text, with the context of the task, with the, um, with the um, writing tools, with the knowledge, the ideas, with the representation. So, what I'm saying is that uh, um, when you um, introduce a new tool, as for example, which, have, uh, which uh, has affordances of visuals as learning, as um, Claire mentioned, uh, this tool is penetrating already an organization. It's a web of relationships that, uh, that get challenged, that, get, uh, um, that are going to change. So, um, so it takes uh, so it takes time this uh, this transformation. So uh, sometimes we might think that uh, uh, someone is slow, or or, or the uh, our educational institutions are slow with integrating technologies. But I don't think that 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 is fair, because uh, the kind of changes uh, that need to be done have to do with the history, mm -hmm. century of years of. Of, um, of organizing learning and teaching in a specific way. So, um, so it's a cultural change fundamentally. Uh, yeah, it the, is. In the, in the teaching uh, environment. It, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it is. It's, uh, yeah. Uno. Yeah, well, well uh, again, to, 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 to link to what Claire said and also Teresa, is that what I work with is uh, exploring things, uh, letting my learners to, to understand things and, and, and uh, by they exploring, testing and, and do things using visualization, simulation and so on. So for example, not reading a textbook. If the client in the social care unit blah, 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 says this, then act like that. But okay, if I try this, if I say this or, or if I do this, what will happen? So my learners, they, 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 they are totally free to do a lot of mistakes. And that's why I think this is good with a simulated environment where you can test things in a safe way. So, so they are learning by doing, by exploring, and that also leads to engagement and motivation. And that's what I think is very, very important because reading a textbook or reading a whatever thing is often at least uh, seen, seen, seen by, by, by young people a little bit boring. But if you try things, you test things and so on, that is most of the time a little bit more engaging, I think. I, I'm incredibly threatened by all this, but I'm realizing I'm a literature major from a very <laughs> traditional environment. So, <laughs> so it, it is very exciting. Johan? Yeah, uh, I mean, what we are talking about, about here, <coughs> creating motivation, uh, I think is a key a factor for for reaching good edu education and uh, to, to be able to explore and also to make things wrong is very important and learn from your mistakes. Yeah. This is very much how a scientist work also. So it's nothing, nothing strange with that. But in school, it's very bad to make wrong. Uh, you, this is a cultural thing, I think. So, so we, uh, but on the internet, I can see 
this is a real change to the, that it's okay to to do wrong and also discuss that and also put very open questions and i think um, today people who, who wouldn't be able to, to raise uh, their hand in, in a classroom situation can just put a comment on a web page or whatever it's, it's very b simple and basic to just write your thought even if it's stupid, as a comment on a web page. Like uh, if I were, I'm writing something here on the university wall, you write it on the wall for the university if you want to ask something. Uh, so many universities are centuries old, literally, and rely very heavily on tradition. And I was educated at a university that is literally a thousand years old. And, and it was great. But one thing that, I, that you inevitably notice there is that institutions to survive for a long time, they must be resistant to change. And, and there are many valuable things that comes with being resistant to change, but I, I sometimes felt, even though I was a very happy student, that maybe this is counterproductive to the agenda, to the educational agenda um, somehow. Let's imagine that we get to design a university from scratch just between, between the four of you. Um, I, I, I don't expect you all to, to agree, but I'm, I'm curious, if you would start higher education and just making it any way you want, how would you begin? Let's start over here with Johan. Well, uh, uh, everything should be made as simple as possible, I think, uh, but not simpler. In Albert Einstein said that once. Uh, so th this is uh, something that could be done differently today. Today it's very complicated. So, um, actually, if you, you can make it much, much more simpler and uh, in that way create motivation and uh, such things. And uh, also, I think, I mean, in the old buildings for the university, you can see how, how they are organized. So, the buildings are a manifestation, manifestation for how things are organized. And so, <laughs> my university would, would, uh, would be able to have it in my pocket, uh, for, for example. This is one manifestation for, for the university. But I, I don't, I'm not quite sure what you mean by simpler. What would be simpler? Well, for example, uh, as an individual, as a human being, um, you, you can actually, through the internet, uh, structure things f uh, from a point of view that you, you, you believe that you're, you, yourself is the center of the universe. <laughs> um, it sounds complicated, but it's quite a quite simple idea. Um, um, also, uh, I mean, simpler in a way that everything is very transparent. If yeah. you want to learn something, it should also be accessible. How will I, will I be assessed? How will it, will it be measured if I learn something or not? Okay, Today, yeah. it's a big secret. At the end of the course, perhaps you understand how it was measured, but in many cases, you don't understand even after the course how you were assessed. I see. Mm. Uh, Teresa, what would you add or change? Yeah, well, I'm thinking um, how I would approach the, the, uh, the students then. And I think that uh, it, will very, it will be very, very nice that uh, universities see the, uh, the students as, uh, as, creatives, uh, as creative, as, as producers, as people who uh, are, um, are participated in many different uh, arenas, um, yeah, people who um, they want to know about something, but they also want to become someone. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, yeah, I will try to, to address uh, this, this, um, these aspects of uh, trying to look then, as Claire mentioned before, uh, the human being. So it's not only about... Uh, yeah, yeah, um, Knowing something is also about uh, doing something or becoming some someone. So, uh, mm. what about Uno? Well, <laughs> the future university. I would take away the lecture halls and that stuff, and, and, and uh, have more open uh, uh, ideas about discussions like this, for example. Okay. Uh, te telling the students from 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 day one. This is your problem. Uh, tell me when you solve that, then you're done. Then you're graduated. I've been working with med medical education me me during many years. So, so my dream is, is to, to give the students from the first day, here are a bunch of patients. Take care of them. Tell me when you're done and I can help you.
and kind of up here. But I, I did maybe look a little scared there. <laughs> some, some of those could be virtual. So you can start to, to do that to, to, to begin with. But again, working with real life problems and then the teachers, your supervisors, uh, older students, senior students, help them and, and, and discuss with them and, and, and try to find both the knowledge and the skills to solve it. That, that's more or less my, my, my dream. But surely, just as is, I do have to kind of learn the letters to be able to look things up on my own. I, surely in medical training, there is some kind of base amount of knowledge that needs to be transmitted in yeah. some kind but of traditional way first. But you don't need to have a guy standing here, blah, 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 blah. You can do that on the web page or using your, your tablet or whatever devices that will be in the yeah. future. Uh, but so the teacher should not standing here and just repeating <laughs> things that have been printed. The teacher should be here, discuss with the students instead. Very well. Claire, at, the, at your hypothetical university, would I be allowed books? <laughs> oh, yes, of course. But um, what I would change is I would do away with diplomas as they are today. And students would only get into universities universities if they have a personal project for development and liberation. How they will develop and liberate themselves in order to become socially conscious uh, human beings. And um, once they have this project, then uh, he would have assigned a mentor to work with in order to find out what does he need from the university to develop this project. And the project would be a life project, sort of developing a person. I think uh, and a socially conscious person, therefore group work would come in and, and all that. But uh, the diploma would be the curriculum vitae uh, where you would have all that this person has accomplished during the two, three, four, five years that he's been at the university. Not only in terms of what he's learned, or I mean, the subjects he's tackled, but what has he accomplished in terms of producing knowledge or producing changes in society? That's very beautiful. Uh, I'm, we're going to let the, the, the audience in. Uh, and it's still questions. I, I, maybe you will feel a need to tell us about your education system. Let's not do that now. Let's, let's ask questions of the speakers since we have them. Who, who has a question on their mind? Yes, let's start over there. Yes, yeah. And can I have your name first, please? Hi, my name is Bernard. Hi, I'm a student here at DSV, Stockholm University. And I have a question, uh, when we have all this creativity in the future, how is the future of grading? Yes, very <laughs> interesting. How, how, what is the, thank you for your question. What is the future of grading? Uh, the future of grading, that's a ve very good question. Uh, the future of grading is that I give you a number of problems and depending on how you're, you are solving those problems, the, the grades will be based on that, not written traditional exams. Mm -hmm. Do you all agree? I can add something here also. I mean, t today, when we grade people, we, we are very, we, we think we are very safe to, to looking at the ID card and uh, checking that it's the right person and give them a paper and some problems perhaps. Um, but in the future, I think, I mean, computers are very good in taking care of many kinds of data at the same time. So we can um, look at different types of information pointing into the, the same uh, target, so to say. I mean, if it's learning goal. So, so we can very easily give a transparent map on, on what, what, who is this person? Is it a real person or is it some fake person? We can see if many things point into that phenomenon we call UNO or whatever. And um, uh, we can also see uh, different kinds of indication on if he or she have learned something. So uh, this open up a lot of, I mean, s some simple uh, examination process and, and uh, some more advanced grading process. But if we are transparent, we can say that... First you have to pass the Turing test yeah, and then... Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get to do some actual exams. Yeah, and but some work. we can also say that this was a very simple... I asked him a few questions and I put an A on him, but mm. I don't know anything more. I mean, this could be one grading. Another type of grading could be for one year, the, the person have worked on projects and a lot mm -hmm. of things. And we, we can be transparent and say... Uh, um, Mm. What, say what we know exactly. Like when Google are ranking pages, um, they, they look actually backwards and see how many other pages are referring to that um, other, th th this page should be ranked. So we, we can see if other students are 
referring to that student, for example, and think he's good, then perhaps he has a very high grade in, in the other or people's mind. Or they're just super popular. Yeah, exactly. It can be that also. <laughs> uh, but today, if you're popular, popular at a, for a teacher, you get a high grade, perhaps. Well, yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, yeah. So that uh, interesting. You al always have this problem. I, I am completely... All my understanding about learning is undermined by this conversation. <laughs> yes, we have another question here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, hello. My name is um, Lou DeFanti. I go to Stockholm University, uh, master's student. And um, my question for you is, um, the American theorist uh, John Dewey talks about learning by doing, um, experiential learning. Um, do you feel as though the learning in the future will involve learning by doing um, the experience versus the, the lecture-driven education that we've been seeing over the past few hundred years? Thank you for your question. Will there be, well, I, now having heard you, I almost want to ask, will there be any other kind of learning than learning by doing? <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to go first? I, uh, I, no? I can start with that. Uh, and and as, as you had maybe heard from me, yes, learning by doing, absolutely the majority of things will be that. And also grading by doing. Uh, giving you a number of virtual cases. Uh, if you are, are going to be a lawyer, you get a number of virtual law clients to solve their problems. And depending on how you do that, not only if you have the correct thing in, in the end, but how you do that, the, check in the process, that would be the part of the grading. So yes, learning by doing and assessment by doing. Okay, interesting. Any, do you, does anybody want to add? Yes, you want? Mm. I, I think the, the lectures in the future will be very much about setting a context together. I mean, sometimes it's easier to just meet. Um, so, so we can have lecture, but with another role, I think. And, uh, but it, it's based then on that, that, that uh, people actually have been trying out things before, because otherwise when you meet, it's a kind of confusing uh, conversation. So uh, there's always a first step you do yourself, and then you meet. I think this is some kind of pr principle. Um, uh, so, mm. but very much learning by doing, and I mean, looking at YouTube is a classical example today. My son is uh, learning how to play like Jimi Hendrix on his guitar by just looking at YouTube. <laughs> I, I, there is something connected to this, of course, which has to do with this idea of lifelong learning as a, as an inevitable necessity in in the in the kind of change changing society that that we're living in. And I, I think what you're the kinds of educations that you are su suggesting do kind of point that, uh, at preparing the student for, for taking care of themselves, sort of, so mm -hmm. to speak, further on, or being able to return um, without, in a more flexible manner uh, further on in, in life. Do, do any of you have any, any reflections on this idea of learning, learning forever? I, I think yeah. the, the society today is so complex that you absolutely you need to learn, learn con constantly. Uh, you can't go out to med school or teacher training school or, or law school and say, OK, now I know everything for, for, for life. Uh, I myself, actually, I'm a dentist by training, which is very odd. Uh, it's a little surprising. Since, <laughs> I, since I'm a, a, a <laughs> professor in computer science, yes. But I would be a nightmare. It would be dangerous. Uh, mm -hmm. to be a dentist practicing now because I haven't trained for 30 years. So, so, so that's say, okay, so lifelong learning must be there. Mm. Yeah. Did we have a question from this? Yes, uh, from the back, please. Yeah. Mm. Hello, I study at KTH and I have a question about boredom because I believe that <laughs> learning to handle boredom is actually a skill. And I also believe that it must be taught uh, in both higher education and throughout life and lower education. And in an education system where everything is interactive, is there any place to learn how to handle boredom? This is a wonderfully wise question. Uh, who would like to begin? <laughs> Johan. I think, first of all, everything will not be di digital, so to say, or, and automatic. It will be more visible, this kind of important stuff you're talking about, boredom handling yourself, being a good decision maker for yourself and others, and learn how to handle uh, leadership and su such things. Um, still, we don't have the, the culture set up, I think, uh, how, how to make use in a good way of all technology. Um, um, 
but life is very hard and, and uh, boredom is one part of that. And of course, um, I think by sharing with others, that this is the key thing. Through internet, you get, can meet other minds and share your feelings. And uh, When I was raising teenagers, they, sometimes they asked, what is the meaning in my life of learning this subject? And I couldn't give them a good answer. So I said, mm. the meaning is, you know, that you're being prepared for the work market. Sometimes you have to show up on time and perform tasks that are meaningless to you. And that's life. And then they said, okay. And then they went away to practice that. Mm. I, 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 you are all talking about a wonderfully meaningful education. Mm. But isn't it a little bit a pipe dream to think that the students would then go out and have actually meaningful jobs? I, I, I think I think we should take this mm. boredom mm. question mm. really seriously. Mm. We mm. should maybe in uh, we sh education should prepare us for 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 not always having meaningful tasks mm -hmm. to do? Or, mm -hmm. or am I wrong here? Mm. Yeah, but I, yeah, I think that that's a great question because it puts the finger on the, um, I mean, which kind of, which image or model of society we have in the, in the world of education, for which kind of world we are preparing our students. And I think that uh, uh, one of the problems is that probably we think a lot about the future in a very, sometimes if we look at the curriculum in a very positive way and uh, instead of looking at uh, the uh, dilemmas that uh, plenty of dilemmas that uh, um, that uh, we have today in, in society so uh, so I, uh, I i guess that the challenge is to try to focus on what is going on and trying to look at the uh, realities of the uh, social, political, energetic, mm -hmm. um, economic problems, and try to see what we can, what they can do uh, with these problems today, because they are not going to disappear in the future. Yeah, well, Claire. I don't think the question is good myself because I think it means if you want to train people with boredom, means that you're training them to accept yeah. society as it is, mm. and I think. That other things to change in society and personally I would train people to uh, expect that they are capable of changing society. So training people yeah. for boredom is also training people for obedience uh, yes. and suffering. Yeah. Uh, well I, th that is also yes we have a follow-up here. Yeah, yeah. And also uh, it's sort of connected to teach someone to be constantly creative and productive isn't that like a straight road to being burnt out oh, isn't that <laughs> unhealthy <laughs> in some ways yeah. thank you so much claire uh, claire did you have a response to this yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, developing yourself is not necessarily being very very active all the time it's taking time to integrate your life and to um, attend to the goals of your life to see what you want to become and to progressively liberate yourself from uh, the very cozy, perhaps, uh, world that you were raised in, in order to take over your role in the world. And there are many different ways of doing this and many different periods and, and types of activities to do this. But uh, basically, the, the problem is always the basic aim of people. I think kids today, when you look at what are what drives them today, what kind of ideals or success stories do they have in mind? And, and you know as well as I do that uh, the media imposes these success stories. And in these stories, like be it people from TV, from the sports or whatever, uh, there's very little room for knowledge. It's not people that deal with knowledge that represent the success stories today. And th that's why the, the problem is um, the kids have to be confronted with types of ideals that mm. uh, will allow them to know how to develop themselves and liberate themselves. Thank you. Uh, we've run out of time. And <laughs> there's so much to say. Certainly, we've learned that learning by doing uh, is going to be the future and that we're going to need room for reflection uh, and that we're teaching students uh, for a life of change. It's fantastic. I really would love to continue, but, but we really do, don't, uh, do not have any more time. Uh, thank you uh, to all of my guests, Claire Belayla, Teresa Cerata Bergman, Uno Fors and Johan Torbjörnsson. Crosstalks will be back next month with more great minds and intelligent discussions. Be sure to check in at crosstalks.tv for updates on topics and guests. Until then, be safe.
and be brave.